And... Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm here with the folks at iFixit and we're going to talk about exemptions for repair to the DMCA. The DMCA is one of probably your favorite laws, one of those things that made it so that when you buy a DVD movie for $25, it was illegal for you to, to rip it so that you could put it on your portable media player and watch it anywhere other than your home. There's all sorts of lovely little bits in that law, whether it's the inability to watch your movie on your phone without paying for it again, or your inability to change a broken part in your PlayStation or Xbox without going back to Sony or Microsoft. So with that, we have uh, Jessa, KK, Kyle, and Carrie, and yeah, and and my duck. So everybody that's on my channel, I wanted to let make sure you're not confused. You're seeing Lewis, but you're on my channel. You're also seeing the same exact stream on the iFixit channel. So we're trying to do this at three different places at once, and we're here to talk to Kyle and hear about that crazy thing. You guys remember the fix, the DMCA, where it used to be illegal to unlock, carry or unlock your own iPhone, and now it's not. But it could be illegal again if this law that's up for renewal doesn't get renewed. So we're going to hear all about that, and there's nobody that knows more about this stuff than Kyle and Carrie from iFixit. So Kyle, tell us all about this stuff. So the, the DMCA is the law that, that is responsible for YouTube videos getting taken offline. I think probably all of us have seen that. We've seen video removed to the DMCA. There, it's a interesting sort of broad law that governs copyright of all things. Copyright is designed to protect creators, uh, but there is a section of the DMCA, uh, section 1201, that is a real problem. And it's, it was a mistake for Congress to pass this law in the first place. It's a mistake for it to continue to be around. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bore all of you and show you the actual law here real fast, uh, just, just to kind of kind of set the stage. So this is the Cornell Law School, and I know none of us are normally wanting to look at law. I really hate that I have to be on here talking about copyright law at all. I don't want to have to talk about copyright. I want to be fixing things. Um, but the, what this law says is no person shall circumvent a technological measure that controls access to a work protected under this title. And what that means is that software is a work that's protected under the title. And so any physical device that has a lock on it that has software, uh, like, say, a cell phone, uh, you know, your, your cell phone is locked to AT&T or Verizon. Uh, if you want to bypass that lock, it is a violation of the DMCA. And increasingly, we're seeing manufacturers put locks on all kinds of things, specifically to stop people from fixing them. So this is a cartoon that ran alongside an article that I did where he says, hey, you're under arrest for circumventing a technological measure that controls access to this tire. It looks like you'll be needing a new car. And this seems totally ludicrous, but tires these days have pressure sensors in them. They're attached to the overall car. And it's very possible that you would need to uh, break a software lock to modify the ECU of the car to tell it about the new tire pressure sensor. Um, so th this feels like a dystopian nightmare. Uh, and I am here to tell you we are living in that dystopian nightmare right now. Uh, and so every, uh, fortunately, like we have this, this terrible law passed in 98, we're all dealing with it. Fortunately, Congress built an escape hatch into the law where we can ask for exemptions for things like fixing tires. Carrie, can you walk us through, like what does that, that three-year process look like? Yeah, absolutely. So every three years, the Copyright Office uh, holds a rulemaking proceeding where they ask people to petition for new exemptions that they want uh, for the right to circumvent these these digital locks. And uh, that that includes, you know, you file a petition, you have to hire a lawyer or work with a legal clinic, uh, you file comments, arguing, making legal arguments in favor of your exemption, you have to uh, file multiple rounds of comments, usually uh, you get one, opposition gets one, then you get another one, then there's a hearing process. Process. So the Copyright Office holds a series of hearings for everyone who wanted to, uh, who requested an exemption. And so this year, the we re requested, I fix it, requested two exemptions uh, to allow you to fix your stuff. So one, we ex requested an exemption for the ability to repair video game consoles that have optical drives. And two, we requested an exemption for the ability to repair all software enabled devices. So everything from your software enabled cat litter box to your laptops to your uh, lawn or tractor yeah. or tractor uh and which you know is an exemption that we won in, in previous years and yeah. kyle and i'll be going to this hearing these guys are all ip lawyers uh, we <laughs> saddle up so these guys are strawberry farmers in santa maria uh and and these guys are intellectual property lawyers we got everybody together banded together 
fought on behalf of farmers and we were able to get an exemption to legalize tractor hacking. Yeah, and, the, and so uh, next week on Tuesday, uh, Kyle and I will be testifying at the Copyright Office uh, in favor of these exemptions, arguing against the opposition. So, you know, opposing these exemptions, we have folks like the Equipment Dealers Association and the DVD Copy Control people and the Entertainment Software Alliance, uh, all, all of those folks who are trying to keep us from getting the right to fix our stuff. And so we'll be coming up against them and answering questions from the Copyright Office and trying to argue in favor of that exemption. That's on Tuesday morning. Uh, and we can... Uh, share out the link in a little bit in the in the uh, chat. Um, but hey, also, Carrie. yeah, thank you. So let's say that you got sick, you and Kyle, you got the Rona, and you can't make it on Tuesday, you're laid up, it's not happening, nobody shows up for to argue for these exemptions. And so the, the librarian says, no exemptions, nothing passes. How would my life be affected the most? Like I'd wake up the next day, what would happen? Yeah, so you would wake up the next day and you would still be vulnerable to being sued by a company for violating 1201, so violating this law. So if you violate the law that Kyle just showed you, uh, you're potentially subject to massive amounts of civil damages, so huge money judgments against you, or possible jail time. Uh, so you could go to jail for breaking the DRM that's that's preventing you from accessing the software code on your devices. And so uh, the current state of affairs is that for any device that doesn't already have an exemption from the Copyright Office, uh, if you break the DRM on that you, you know, could get sued or could end up in jail, uh, and that's, you know, that if we didn't, if we didn't, don't win these exemptions this year, that'll be the, continue to be the state of affairs after the hearings. Um, one thing to note, though, the Copyright Office isn't going to make its decision in that hearing live. Uh, we'll be seeing its decisions probably in the fall. They tend to release them around October, uh, so they'll take some time to consider everything that was said at the hearings, take meetings with people, consult with the, 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 an entity called the NTIA uh, and the federal government. And then they'll produce their recommendation in the fall, which is then given to the Library of Congress who either adopts the recommendation or, or, or doesn't, but pretty universally adopts. But a, a really good example of this process going totally haywire is it used to be legal in the US to unlock phones to move it from AT&T to Verizon. And then one year, the Copyright Office woke up on the wrong side of the bed, denied the exemption, and the US became the only country in the world where it was illegal to move your phone from AT&T to T-Mobile. Uh, and this had huge, wide-reaching impact. It meant that repair shops that were doing phone unlocks for people were doing it illegally and were open to liability. It totally screwed over all the electronics recyclers that are accustomed to getting phones, unlocking them, and then selling them overseas. It did hundreds of millions of dollars of economic damage. Uh, and it took three years to unwind because we had to wait for the next three-year process. So does that have to do with like me putting check rain on a phone in order to recover data from it by rolling it back to an I earlier iOS? Would that be yes, a modification? Absolutely. Yeah, so, so I could go to jail? If, if they did not renew, one of the existing exemptions is for jailbreaking phones. If they don't renew that, that phone jailbreak exemption, then absolutely you could go to jail. And, and Carrie, what's the criminal penalties for violating 1201? Oh gosh, um, I, I don't remember exactly. One hundred and fifty thousand dollars in damages <laughs> per instance, plus up to eight years in jail. I think it's crazy, uh, and this is not academic. Our good friend Sina Conifar, uh, he uh, he developed the first jail. Uh, it wasn't jailbreak; it was an unlock for the Motorola Razor phone back in the day, and Motorola sued him for hundreds of thousands of dollars of damages. I think, that, well, they said per instance, and he was helping thousands of people unlock their razors, and we're trying to send him to jail for this just for unlocking a phone. Jeez. So the, the one that we're concerned about right now is game consoles. Uh, so it, uh, Lewis, do you, do you ever d deal with the optical drive problems repairing game consoles? I haven't, I don't do anything with game consoles. But all we've ever done most is, you know, data recovery on the drives from them when they start clicking. But, uh, you know, the, the idea, you're talking about the fact that if you change the drive, the drive is paired to the device, so you have to have it changed by the manufacturer. Yeah. That's incredibly annoying. I mean, it's it's one of these things where people don't believe me when I say that you know if you uh, that that you have to go back to the dealer, but you actually literally do have to go back to the dealer in that case to get that part fixed. Yeah, that's what when I asked Brad, who will never show up on camera, hey, what is something that you can think of that might uh, you know that this impacts your life? That was the first thing he said was you know oh you mean like the optical drive on all the game consoles and then and then two of them walked in the door right now, so that's a that is a big one. Do you think that? You're going to get that exemption, Kyle? 
So the, the game console exemption is the one I want the, the the most bad to get. We have been applying for this one and failing. Like we, we applied for this six years ago. We applied for this three years ago and the copyright office keeps saying no. And so it continues to be illegal uh, to do these optical drive swaps. It's infuriating. Uh, I fix it. We would like to sell just an optical drive and then say, here's the optical drive, run the software program, pair it with your Xbox and you're good to go. We can't sell that part. And instead we have to sell people a combo new motherboard plus optical drive, which is so expensive. You might as well just buy a new game console. What's the opposition argument for not allowing you to change the drive? I imagine it's piracy. And one of the things that I've noticed with most of the arguments is that they very rarely, if ever, actually bring up an instance of where that happens. So when they say safety, it's a safety issue. They'll never bring up this person hurt themselves from a fixed device and here's how. So when they bring, what do they bring up? And when they bring this up, do they ever bring up an actual citation of how this would happen? They uh, say the sky will fall. Uh, so this is, you know, Microsoft and Sony and Nintendo were too chicken to show up and oppose us themselves. And so instead they send their, their lawyers, they send the Entertainment Software Association to oppose us. And actually I have a, I have a photo here. Uh, so this is uh, three years ago, this was us testifying. It's me in the center. You have Matt, uh, who uh, is a good friend of ours. He's an independent repair guy. Robert Miranda runs a Xbox repair operation in Barstow. Um, this guy on the right is representing the entertainment software industry. And he's, he's sitting there making $1,000 an hour to, to show up and, and make it so that we can't fix our things. Uh, I'd be and, a way and better lobbyist for 1000 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> The arguments are crazy. They'll say things like, you know, it, it will unlock uh, hordes of pirates, right? All of a sudden, you know, the, the video game companies will will completely go out of business because too many people will be pirating video games. And we're over here saying, we just want to fix the game console. We want it to work again. We don't want it to be a pirate piracy vehicle. Some of the other opposition has said things like, well, it's going to undermine the market for that software, that if we allow people to, to unlock this the digital lock on the, on the pairing software, that that pairing software is going to lose its marketability. Um, and that the DVD copy controls mechanisms, the DRM on your, on your optical disc is going to lose marketability, um, which, is, which is patently ridiculous and not a concern for copyright law. And we hear just these nonsensical arguments. I mean, they'll say things like people can hurt themselves so they could fix their game consoles. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and hear, you know, in the in the automobile context that if someone can fix their tractor or their car that they're then gonna violate emissions controls and that that's why the copyright office shouldn't let them fix their cars. What would it look like for me to actually, uh, let's say you win and you get an exemption so now, just for the game console, that would allow me to solve a problem where I've bought and paid for a PlayStation and the drive stops working, which does, I remember having a student in here worked on these things, and he said that a motor failure of the drive was really common. You know, just like any kind of motor that you sort of manually stop, that thing gets gummed up, it's going to fail. And so being able to replace that was something that was had a lid legitimate mechanism for failure. So with the exemption, I would be able to go just get another drive, plug it in there, and play the games that I paid for. I don't understand why, what, what is the protection there now? Like what is the, how, how, how does it work right now that there's a protection? I don't understand that. What is keeping me from, from you know, ripping a copy of Super Mario Brothers or whatever you play on PlayStations? CSGO. Is that, is that one? Right. Yeah. So the, the, the drive is, con is connected. It's kind of paired at the factory to the main board and there's a cryptographic tie there. So in order to, in order to make it work, in order to be able to make a new uh, drive work, if you took, if you took two PlayStations and you swapped the heart the, the optical drives on them, you then have to pair or marry the, uh, the new drive to the, to the unit. And that involves basically doing the same thing that check rain does. You have to basically, Break open the thing, pair the new one, and then relock it down. Um, and, and I mean, what's so frustrating is there are plenty of these drives out there. You have the the motor in your drive fails. Well, I can go to the electronics recycler and take PS5s that were about to go, well, maybe not PS5s, PS4s, PS3s <laughs> that were about to go into a shredder, uh, and and I can pull those drives and, and we can sell them. And I mean, I have those drives sitting on a shelf when I fix it, but they don't. You can't make them work unless you have this software tool to pair the new drive. Yeah, it's that, but I don't understand how the existence of the native drive 
how does that prevent me from playing? I mean, I assume this is all about your, it's trying to prevent me from sticking a DVD in there that is a copy that I didn't pay for. Yeah. That my friend, like how, how does the native drive prevent me from doing that? There's some fancy sauce in these optical drives and there's a fancy chip on them that can detect the difference between a genuine uh, Blu-ray game and a ripped Blu-ray game. Uh, and, and that's the copy protection that they're afraid of. They don't want you to modify the, the optical drive to be able to read ripped discs, which is, you know, mod chips for game consoles are a thing, right? Uh, and so this is why they're so sensitive about this. Uh, and, and we from the repair world are saying, hey, look, you know, mod chips should be illegal. That's fine. That's, you know, uh, if you're going to steal someone's game, that is its own violation of the Copyright Act. But it, it, you know, the act of repairing the console should not be its own, its own uh, violation. And so this is like the legal term for this. We say that the repair, as long as the repair is for the sake of a repair and not an activity that you're engaging in, in, in an act of pi piracy, right? We're just doing the, the bypass. We're not, we're not uh, attempting to pirate games. There's kind of a double jeopardy where they want they want there to be two laws where it's illegal to pirate games. It's illegal to pirate the game, and it's illegal to break the lock so that you can pirate the game. Well, why does it? Why do we need double jeopardy? One law should be sufficient. Yeah, I like that. That makes sense. Yeah, and to be honest, like, this be law it's not preventing people from pirating games or installing mod chips, right? It's only preventing people who want to respect the law, who want to do legal repairs from being able to do that, right? If you don't care about copyright law, if you're like copyright scoff law, you're just gonna go ahead and install the mod chips and pirate the games anyway. And, and you know, we know that people are already doing that. So it just really doesn't add any kind of extra deterrence or anything like that. It just makes it harder for people who wanna do the legal repairs. Yeah, people have been pirating stuff since the beginning of time. I mean, you know, the whole idea that you shouldn't be allowed to rip a DVD didn't stop DVD decryptor from working. It didn't stop the DVD movies from showing up on Emule, Nutella, Usenet, Casa, Soulseek, like everything. And, you know, there are tons of torrent sites out there where if you want to pirate a game and you don't want to pay for it, you can. Like, not even getting into the morality of whether it's right or wrong, but all this is doing is stopping people from being able to fix their device, not actually stopping piracy, which is still rampant to this, to this day. Yeah, uh, this particular uh, law just drives me absolutely up the wall. I mean, what they're saying when when they say you know you can't circumvent the technological protection measure, th there's it's really just math. It's it's me typing numbers and letters into 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 a computer to be able to to break this encryption. Um, and and the idea that certain kinds of math would be illegal as an engineer that drives me absolutely crazy. It's it, this is a free speech issue. Like the, the, this law is basically saying if I have the Let's say I've got the computer code for, well, I, I'll, I'll pull up and I'll show you. So uh, the, the computer code for uh, removing uh, the encryption from a DVD uh, is on Wikipedia. Here we go. So this is the math that allows you to remove the encryption from, D, from a DVD. Uh, the act, I believe, of showing you this may well be a violation of Section 1201 of the DMCA. Like, it is it is outrageous that... that um, this law is restricting free speech. Copyright is supposed to incentivize the creation of creative works, and, and it's doing exactly the opposite. I think it's going to be like really funny. Which one of you guys is going to be going to jail for that? Would it be KK? Because she's kind of like, you know, the, the only thing here on the stream, you're in charge of it. You're the one going to jail because this stream. Wait, I'm going to jail, and so is Lewis now. Hopefully none of us are going to jail. <laughs> we know we're good lawyers. <laughs> I, I, have I get in the top bunk. I'll say it's not just software too. Like we see companies arguing that like the shape of a particular card is is a TPM or a particular attachment for a dongle is a TPM. Um, so it's not just, you know, companies saying, well, you shouldn't be able to, to do the decryption. It's like, you shouldn't be able to just access the software period. And they're, they're arguing that kind of every possible thing could constitute a lock to keep, that's designed to, to keep you out and protect access to the software. It's kind of crazy. Like this law was passed in 1998. It was designed to prevent people, as we've just discussed, like from pirating creative works, from copying DVDs and distributing them on the internet. It was not uh, 
you know, in 1998, the kind of technology that we're talking about largely now, like was not in the scope of this law, was not in the minds of the members of Congress who are passing this law. As one of my favorite uh, law professors has said, Congress might have been thinking about the celestial jukebox, but they certainly weren't thinking about the celestial refrigerator. Like <laughs> the kind of devices that now have software uh, were, were just like not considered uh, at all when this law was passed. And because of that, like, the, and because of this law's super broad language, it applies to almost every device it now because software is in almost everything um, rather than just sticking to what it's supposed to do, which is, you know, prevent piracy. So why don't we put you guys on the spot? I love to do that and say, especially you, Carrie, you're an attorney, right? That's your job. What? Uh, I am an attorney. I'm not practicing. Well, you're, <laughs> let's have you practice today. What if nope, you had to? Work. What if you had to to argue, uh, make an argument from the opposition? And I, I I really like when I sit and hear all the right to repair hearings or whatever. I think it's it's always good to try and put yourself on the other side of the table and try to figure out what is the nugget within your argument that is valid. So what is that? What's the what's the the nugget of truth that? You know, where, where can we kind of identify with why, are, why is anybody even bothering to show up on the opposition side? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think when we think about game consoles, I think there is a real concern on the opposition side that, that people will do exactly what we just talked about, that they'll uh, circumvent the TPMs that are pairing the optical drive to the motherboard and the console, and then they'll install a mod chip and they'll you know use it to play pirated games. And then that'll undermine the market for um, for legitimate games, which would then like make it harder for video game creators to make a living. Uh, but again, like that argument is really, it's going beyond what we're really asking for. What we're asking for is the right to repair something, the right to repair our video game consoles. We're not asking for the right to pirate something. And so, um, you know, that all of the things that they're afraid of, piracy, cracking, uh, DVD encryption uh, or optical disk encryption, uh, installing mod chips, that's all still illegal and would still be illegal under 1201. So they'd still have this big scary law that they could go after people with. Um, so it sounds like also be able to fix things. It sounds like <laughs> the manufacturers want you to be required to lock your car in order to deter theft. I don't want to lock my car. My car's not locked right now. You can go out and steal it. It's right out front. I'm in here streaming. Everybody knows that. Well, they want, take my car now. it's not just that they want you to be required to lock your car. It's that they want to lock your car for you every time you get out of it. And they want to be in charge of when you can unlock it again. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like that. That's a lot of control. Dr. O's law is if someone puts a lock on something that you own and doesn't give you the key, they're not doing it for your benefit. Yeah. I like that. Like why? Okay, I sell you a car. Here's your car. Here's your key. <laughs> or, but I mean, in the modern world, and we see this with with iPhones, right? You get a phone, you can't load any app that you want on it, right? It has to go through the Apple gatekeepers. Uh, is that really for your benefit? Yeah, I like that. They also like we haven't really seen a lot of cases that were brought by the video game console manufacturers over 1201 in the U.S. Uh, the, there's only one case that I'm aware of, and it was a Canadian case um, of a few years ago, but. But you know, for all of this insistence that they need this law to prevent piracy, they use it very rarely, if at all. And yet it totally prevents folks like us from selling game console parts. Like iFixit does not sell standalone optical drives for game consoles because of this law. Uh, I would like to. <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, it, this isn't just, so t taking this beyond game consoles, I think that one is near and dear to our hearts, but but the rest of it, uh, th there's a whole world of pretty much any product out there that has a microchip and it has software and 1201 can apply to. So there was a case a couple of years ago, Dorman is a car parts manufacturer and they sell replacement like transmissions for GM trucks and GM sued them for 1201 infringement for selling a tool to enable you to install a transmission in a new in a new truck and the transmission would come with transmission and then a little, little module you plugged into your obd port to take the software from the old transmission and move it onto your new transmission and and gm said no that's a violation of 1201 so you can see like they're just like with with the optical drives on game consoles there are repairs where there is no way to do the repair unless you circumvent a lock gotcha. and increasingly all products have locks they're going to. 
Wasn't this, what, what am I remembering about DRM and coffee? Was that something that had to do with this? Yeah, so uh, I, I believe that's, um, you know, Keurig had a special uh, claim that they had a technological protection measure that wouldn't let you use third party uh, coffee capsules in your coffee machine. Um, and I believe there was a lawsuit about that. Um, and, and it really was just uh, an anti competitive practice, really, they just did not want you to buy your coffee from someone outside of Keurig, which, you know, is not something that copyright law protects, you know, copyright doesn't give you your right to control the market for uh, products or services outside of the, the device itself. Um, so yeah, that is, that's another kind of thing we're talking about is, uh, you know, as manufacturers claim that these different things are technological protection measures, whether it's like a little tab on the on that little K-cap or whether it's, you know, a, a software lock that's keeping you from unpairing your optical drive. Um, a lot of a lot of times these are just, you know, anti-competitive practices by the manufacturer trying to lock you into their systems, their services, uh, buying new consoles when your console breaks, things like yeah. that. I'm seeing in the, on Lewis's uh, channel, Morningstar says, I, I had to replace the optical drive on my PS3 twice. I, he swapped the, the controller board in order to do it. And then he said, eventually the controller board failed and he lost all of his games. So uh, I don't know if that's like a, a subversive motive that they have here where it's, it's not just trying to sell more consoles. They're also trying to sell more games because you lose access. So even if you have the game on the hard drive, if you, the optical drive stops working, then the game that you have on your hard drive stops working. I think the problem was he probably had to get a new machine. I don't know. Well. We've heard from a, from a few folks that um, when you install a new, if your optical drive is broken and you know you go to install the latest update for your machine, that the that that update will check and make sure that your optical drive is running before it like boots up or finishes installing. Uh, and if the optical drive is broken or not present, then it just won't finish uh, installing or won't finish loading, and you just won't be able to play any of your games, including your digital downloads. Well, that stinks. Sure it does. The K cup. So someone was asking, where's the DRM on on a K cup? There isn't actually a chip. Instead, it's in the ink. There is a specially formulated ink in the Keurig brand cups. Uh, and again, the the law says a technological protection measure. It doesn't necessarily say a software protection measure, right? So any kind of protection that they put on things, as long as bypassing that involves accessing some kind of software, can fall out of the law. Do you ever hear from the e bike people? I have not heard of locks with e-bikes. Uh, they, they may exist, uh, and e-bikes would be covered under the exemption that we asked for. But uh, I haven't heard of a problem. I bought an e-bike, which I love, and uh, unlike some YouTubers, I'm smart enough to get it serviced at the dealership <laughs> rather than try to add funky batteries and stuff like that. But I'd like to when it gets old, when it's old enough that I you know, want to mess around with it and change the battery myself. Like I, I got the impression from talking to the very normal repair guy at the bike shop that I wouldn't be able to do that. This was a, a Vado 3.0, I think. Yeah. Um, and I have no idea whether or not that's a thing or not, but it seems like it would be in the. It's increasingly proprietary. It's in the kind of like Apple style proprietary repair where, where you figure out how to fix Apple products. We all really care about a lot. And there's been a lot of smart people working on it. With e-bikes, I think it's all new. Everything's proprietary. And so we just don't know. Uh, so someone needs to be the Jessa of e-bike repair and figure it out and put the an answers on the internet. And then maybe. Yeah, well, as soon as this bike stops working. So far, I love this bike. It doesn't have anything wrong with it. And ride, ride it to work. It's been fantastic. Highly I'll recommend. Make it for you. Uh, <laughs> um, I will let you make it faster as long as you don't have any track record of any kind of fires. No fires. I want the fire-free e-bike. No fires in Rochester so far. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're going fast enough, you can run away from the fire. <laughs> did Lewis explode his e-bike or what? Yes, he did. Rest in pieces. All right, so Kyle, why don't you tell us a little bit more about, you know, so it's, we're having a chat here, but there's a reason why we're talking about this today. And what yeah. is it? What can people do? And wh why are we talking about this today? 
We're talking about this today because the Copyright Office is right in the middle of deciding. They are going to be uh, basically uh, grilling Carrie and I next week, asking us you know, deep technical questions about, about game consoles. And they're going to decide whether it's legal for us to fix game consoles in the future or not. So that, that decision is being made by a very small group of lawyers at the U.S. Copyright Office. It's not, it, this isn't your elected representatives. Uh, this isn't the Biden administration. This is the U.S. Copyright Office. Uh, gets to decide kind of by fiat who uh who can fix who can fix things so we're going to be up uh uh talking next week we could certainly uh use your support um we we need you know people you know tweeting at writing to the copyright office let them know that this matters to them yeah and i think also you know keep part of our larger goal here is this law is broken there is no reason that the, this law should be this broad and that this should continue to stay on the books given how awful it's been for pretty much every good thing in the world, right? It's it's terrible for repair, it's terrible for accessibility, it's terrible for teaching and reporting. You know, there if you if you watch these hearings or if you follow the process, that there are public interest groups and individuals and advocates um, from you know all walks of life who have to, who get dragged into this process every three years just to be able to use their stuff. And so uh, what we what we want, we want this law to change. So we, you know, we're here arguing for these exemptions from the Copyright Office, but really what we think what we think we need is uh, a change to the law. We need our elected representatives in Congress to uh, create a permanent exemption for repair so that we don't have to, you know, muster all of these resources and spend, you know, 500 hours every three years trying to get the Copyright Office to issue a simple exemption. This happens every three years? It happens every three years. Yep. Uh, the Copyright Office has made some changes recently, but um, every three years you have to go back. Uh, if you got an exemption that was passed uh, in the last cycle, you have to go back to the Copyright Office and argue for that exemption again. It How does that work? Do you just, co you just copy and paste last year's argument or? So they're trying to streamline that a little bit more this year. In the past, you had to make all your arguments all over again. Now, if you um, starting this this round, if you were granted an exemption in a past cycle, uh, the the burdens on you are lower unless there's a uh, new opposition or, or substantial opposition to the renewal of the exemption. You can kind of just petition for the renewal and like hope you don't have to make any arguments about it. But if there is substantial opposition, then you have to go and make all the arguments all over again. Uh, and that said, the Copyright Office has been insisting on defining the scope of exemptions super narrowly. So they're essentially doing like device, like very narrow device category by very narrow device category. Uh, so this year we're asking for a broad exemption to be able to fix all software enabled devices, but they've indicated in the past that they're very hostile to that approach and that really we should be going like if this year it's like software enabled light bulbs and next year it's software enabled toothbrushes and next year it's software enabled cat litter boxes. And so there's, a, you know, we're, we're going to have to keep doing this basically like for the rest of our lives. Unless I see what you said. Change. In 2018, it looks like one of them said it's and I quote, it's my own damn car. I paid for it. I should be able to repair it or have the person of my choice do it for me. Was that a quote from someone uh, that, that you included in your evidence or was that from the actual copyright office who said that? Because if that's from them saying that, it seems like they understand the problem will be a little bit no, more. No, it's open. not from them saying that. That's oh. that's from someone who's advocating for the exemption, not the copyright office. Yeah, I figured that was too good to be true because it said <laughs> that that showed up in the report and it's like, there's somebody in our government that believes yeah. in freedom? What, what the well, heck? I'm sure there are, but just generally not as much in the copyright office. Well, it's something that's a little bit frustrating about this is, is it's lawyers who are the ones making the decision. Last I checked, most lawyers make pretty good money and aren't generally one of the people that are fixing things themselves. So they are pretty disconnected from the, need, the needs of the rest of us. Uh, and so we, you know, when I fix it shows up, they are often asking me very basic questions like, if you need to change the tire sensor in your car, what is that? What in, is involved in that? What kind of tooling do you need? Um, they're asking me like, how do you open an iPhone? <laughs> Just like very basic questions. So I feel like we kind of have to bring the the world of reality to the copyright office and explain it to these these lawyers up on their ivory tower. Uh, Where, and wh how can we help? It sounds like you know Carrie sent me a link that I posted on my community tab for public comments. So where is the primary opposition this round? Is it the video game consoles and what else? What do they need to know? Yeah, the, the, two, the two, so is, are we category 12, I think? Uh, there's, there's two exemptions that we're asking for. We're asking for uh, game consoles specifically and then pretty much all, all things that have software. Uh, and we are expecting the Copyright Office will uh, not be super excited about either of those. Um, 
So I would say, you know, the, the biggest thing that you can do is, is call your congressman and complain about 1201. Yeah, I would agree. I would say, you know, watch the hearing and see what kind of questions the Copyright Office may, asks and what kind of statements the opposition makes and, and call your members of Congress, call your senators and tell them that, that you think the law needs to change. Uh, and that's that's what we're all angling for long term. Just to show you kind of how ridiculous this is, uh, I'm going to show you the list of things. This is the exemptions that we got granted last year. So this is the blog on iFixit where we talk about what we got. And so it's like it's legal to unlock phones, tablets, wearables, um, but only if the device is used. If it's new, if it's a new phone, you can't do that. I don't know what the difference is between a new and a used phone, but maybe you do. Um, we got access for cars, tractors, and 3D printers, but not some other things. Um, so th they're breaking this out category by category. Like, like we got an exemption for 3d printers, but not 2d printers. Um, so to be clear, I'm, I, I have a software controlled litter box and I sent a software controlled litter box to Lewis. We both have these right now. Is, am I going to jail? If I start to open that thing up and mess around with it, Mr. Clinton broke If it someone up. finds out, <laughs> well, I'll never tell. <laughs> I'll take that one to the grave. Yeah, and you know that our friends at the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, used the used the litter box, the software enabled litter box, as an example of where uh, people would really like to be able to modify them, change this cleaning schedule, to be like more environmentally responsible, or use. If it's yellow, let it mellow. Precisely, um, and right now that's illegal under copyright law. Let's just think about that for a second. It's illegal under copyright law to change the settings on your electronic litter box. That's uh, correct. It, <laughs> the, the other thing doesn't really matter, but uh, yeah, I mean, like, well, we, you will survive if you can't fix your, your cat litter box, but there are other things that matter a lot more. I don't know, you, I, you, you don't have an indoor cat. I mean, Lewis <laughs> lives in an apartment <laughs> with three cats. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm going with survival being uh, just a time limited. Mr. Clinton is engaged in chemical warfare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he broke that litter box like uh, over a year ago. And you didn't and you didn't fix it because you were afraid of jail time. No, I didn't fix it because it was filled with car with crap. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine that you have a electric wheelchair. Uh, there are and, and you know maybe you have to swap out a tire or something on it, and then you need to change a, a parameter, or there are like acceleration uh, adjustments that you might want to make. Or they're actually in most electric wheelchairs, they have a traction setting. Let's say you're in Minneapolis and it's icy out, and you want to put studs on your electric wheelchair, and uh, you need to access the traction control setting. That's behind a password that the owner of a wheelchair isn't given access to. Uh, so if you want to jailbreak your wheelchair for the purposes of, you know, modifying it to work better for yourself or for fixing it, uh, you're out of luck right now. Yeah. And it can take, if you decide to go like the formal route, try to get the manufacturer to fix it, it can take months. So we, um, we were talking to one advocate in Colorado who had to replace the battery on his wheelchair. And it took over 60 days for the manufacturer to send someone out who was authorized to replace that battery. Uh, so he, that was over 60 days from which he was completely immobile, like, totally exacerbated all of his health conditions. It was just a horrible situation. For something authorized that repair really seems to be done. slow as hell, regardless of the industry. Yeah. I, even that sen the, there was that one senator in, in Washington that said that it took something like it, over two weeks because he had an issue with his, with his Xbox. I'd like to propose that we stop using the word authorized and change that to the word branded repair because that's what it is. And I really liked that when I was reading the Magnuson Moss warranty stuff where that's the wording. It says you can't require somebody to use branded service. So branded repair is what authorized repair is. So let's let's like kind of make a campaign to swap that language. Authorized sounds oh yeah. must be good. Branded sounds hell hellfire. I like it. I'm so I, mean, I might propose cartel, <laughs> <laughs> the cartel <laughs> repair shop, but sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is. Uh, it is a, yeah, if you didn't have competition in your business, you might not be super fast at responding to everybody either because, you know, the customer is going to be there today or next week. Especially if they're in a wheelchair. Yeah. They're not going anywhere. Yeah, that's like, that's got to be against some other kind of law. That's, a, that's, that's, that's wrong. All right. What else We're do we need it. to talk We're about? <laughs> Please send your pacemaker into a branded repair contractor. Yeah. <laughs> 
can we get a link to the hearing? So, yeah, uh, you know, we're going to put the, I put the links to the hearing on the community tab. So if you click over to community, I made a post with both the link to the hearing and to the public comments thing, survey. And uh, I'll put that, I'll move that over to the description. And I'm sure Lewis is busy doing the exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I, I would mention is outside of what the US Copyright Office is working on, there's a lot of other rates repair activity happening right now. Uh, 27 states have introduced bills. Um, there's a lot of momentum. Um, uh, the uh, California uh, Medical Right to Repair Bill just passed out of the Senate Health Committee unanimously yesterday. Very excited about that. The Canadian Parliament uh, had a discussion on, on uh, right to repair, uh, specifically a fix for this copyright issue in, in Canadian law. They had an extensive debate about this yesterday. And, uh, and by extensive, I mean uh, representative after representative came up and talked about how important right to repair was, and not a single representative testified against it. <laughs> so until the lobbyists show up, everyone likes it. Um, that's something I actually I think is important because I know we have an international audience for a lot of these and that um, the US has steadily exported this law in, through trade agreements throughout the world. So almost every trade agreement since 1998 contains a version of Section 1201 uh, and this legal protection for technological protection measures. Uh, most of them also contain some kind of uh, limitations or exceptions. So the, an authorization that a, a nation state can enact certain exceptions. Um, but you know that, that differs in terms of implementation from country to country. And it's bad. It is a bad part of US law. And it is it, uh, it's bad that we have exported that everywhere. This is American imperialism exporting the worst aspects of our law to the rest of the world. And that, that's the only reason it's in Canadian law. So we need to we need to fix it. We need to fix it everywhere. Uh, also, the US Federal Trade Commission is investigating this. And we're expecting that they will release a report later this uh, month on warranty issues. You know, those warranty voided for move stickers are totally bogus and unenforceable, um, but companies keep putting them on products. So maybe the FTC will step up and, and ask them to stop. One Hopefully. of the interesting ones is the robot on LG's website. When you contact them and you ask about fixing something, it says if you if you have an unauthorized person work on it, they say that it voids the warranty. So it's not like something where internally that's their policy, but externally they'll make up a fake reason as to why your warranty won't exist or some kind of tricky language. It's just straight up. We're breaking the law. It's crazy. How do they get away with it? Nobody cares. FTC, how are they getting away with it? <laughs> yeah. We're hopefully FTC will step up. But I mean, I we've been kind of like blown away at the amount of attention that we've uh, been able to get on on all these issues this year. This really feels like a moment for uh, for advocates in our space right now. Yeah, it's important. And this is why we need all of you to help us. <laughs> and this is why both on the state level and the federal level and the international level, you know, make it make it clear to your lawmakers that you support the right to repair, whether it's through state level right to repair legislation or changing Section 1201, reforming copyright law to make repair legal for all software enabled devices. Um, we can't do it without you. Yeah, right. and I know Louis did a video on the FTC thing. It's ftc.repair.org is a forum for, for writing the FTC. Please do that. Uh, many, many thousands of you have, and we super appreciate it. We are going to be, I, I don't think we've announced this yet. We uh, we are going to be hand delivering those petitions. I think we will print them all out and then deliver them to the uh, Federal Trade Commission next week in Washington, D.C. And will you say making it rain? <laughs> <laughs> we might. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, very good. Well, I think we are kind of at the end of the attention span, at least uh, at least I got to go do stuff. And so thanks, guys, for talking to us about this stuff. I had no idea that we had to redo this thing every three years. That's crazy. And it's like Groundhog Day. And I yeah. can tell you, we, had, you know, we often work with legal clinics. And one of the legal clinics we work with out of Harvard Law School, they represented someone for a very simple like medical device data exemption that wasn't opposed several cycles ago and it took over 500 hours of legal work just to get that exemption an exemption that was not opposed. nobody even cared about yeah that's that's crazy and frustrating for sure and you know i think that a lot of us in this space would definitely like to see the game console repairs kind of open up especially for a really common failure of that motor drive so all right yeah. thanks so much and we will put a link in the in the description for uh, how to show up for the hearings because they're on Zoom, so everybody can go. Why not? 
and to submit some comments so that you can help folks that might be lay people understand why this is important. So thank you very much. And Lewis, you can end your stream and I am gonna end my stream right now. Thank you everyone. Right. Thank you, Lewis and Jessa.